opportunity. So this is joint work with uh, Neil Pearson and Josh Pollitt, who are in the audience. Uh, and this is a simple paper which tries to answer a classic question. Uh, so academics have documented several hundred so-called anomalies. So taken at face value, everyone can beat the market by just following those anomaly signals. Of course, uh, well, few investors are able to uh, perform uh, to get consistent alpha. And even though in the recent period, anomaly alphas did uh, decrease, uh, they remain uh, positive and significant. So the question is, why are anomaly alphas still positive? What's the friction that prevents them from going all the way to zero? Let's think about some of those frictions, right? So anomalies are well known, the signals are easy to compute, quantitative funds have ample capital to arbitrage them away. Finally, traditional trading costs are tell historical law thanks to algorithmic trading. But what about short sale costs? And this is what this paper is about. Well, so we show that uh, short sale cost, or more specifically, the borrow fees that short sellers have to pay, is this limit to arbitrage, which really explains why uh, anomaly alphas uh, still remain positive in the recent period. And I think this conclusion adds nicely to the debate on whether anomalies are real or not. So yes, they're real if you pay for trade risk returns, but if you start trading them and have to pay stock borrow fees, those alphas disappear. So what exactly do we do? We study a comprehensive set of anomalies in the US equity market from 2006 to 2020. 2006, because this is when our stock borrow fee data begins. So in this recent period, we confirmed that anomaly alphas are much smaller than in the original papers, but they still remain statistically and economically significant. And what's interesting is all of those remaining alphas on average concentrate in the short lag of the anomalies. So to take advantage of them, short sellers would have to sell those stocks with negative alpha. They will have to pay the borrow fees, which will decrease the short sellers' profits, uh, decrease by how much. So we will uh, take returns and account them for the borrow fee in two different ways. We will first keep the portfolio assignment and drop the stocks with a high borrow fee, which we define as a borrow fee of more than 1% annualized at the end of the month. Uh, about 12% of the total sample will be affected, will have high borrow fees, so it's not that many stocks. So that's one way. The second way will be just to take the borrow fees and treat them like the shadow continuous dividend and add them back to the return. So we have monthly return, we observe the realized borrow fee during the same month, we can add them back. So with those two methods, we uh, adjustments, we, uh, we get the same basic results. Once we adjust returns for the stock borrow fee, anomaly alphas disappear on average, at least in this recent period. Uh, one important caveat, of course, is the markets uh, became much more efficient recently, right? So if we go back to 70s or 80s, of course, anomalies had alphas on the long leg. Of course, regular transaction costs were humongous. But in the recent period, those frictions seem to melt away while the short sale costs kind of remained the uh, main uh, limit of arbitrage there. Okay, the data. So uh, we take all of the stock anomalies in the Chen and Zimmerman data set, and we keep 162 of them uh, for which we can form well-populated decile portfolios. Uh, the stock borrow fees that short sellers pay or expected to pay are from market. Very, very good coverage uh, at the stock by daily level, but only starts in 2006. In the results that I will show you, we drop microcaps to show that the short sale effect is different from the microcap effect. But if we add microcaps back, uh, the results carry through because microcaps have uh, large borrow fees. Uh, most of you probably don't know much about borrow fees, so some uh, simple facts uh, could be helpful. So right now, almost any stock can be shorted. It's just a question of the cost, or more specifically of the borrow fee. And unlike regular transaction costs, which you only pay on the way in and on the way out, stock borrow fees have to be paid every day. So every day I'm short GameStop, I have to pay the borrow fee. And this borrow fee can change uh, from day to day, but it typically will be pretty stable. The good news is borrow fees are fairly small for most of the stocks. So the median stock in our sample has a borrow fee of just under 40 basis points per year. But for 10% of the stocks, the fees can be a couple of percentage points per year or even reach 100% or more. It's important to focus on the fees that short sellers pay because the guys on the long side who lend their shares only get a fraction of the fee. This is why we focus on the fees that short sellers pay. And for me personally, the best way to think about those borrow fees is the shadow continuous dividends. So the borrow fees decrease returns to the short sellers, but they also increase returns to the long side. Think about like regular dividends. If I take a 
a portfolio of stocks with a high regular dividend such as ExxonMobil, but for whatever reason, I will compute returns just based on prices, ignoring regular dividend. Guess what? I will get a large negative alpha because I forget to include dividend. Of course, all of us include regular dividends in the return calculations, but I think none of us include the stock borrow fees in the return calculation. And the results of this paper show that once we account for the shadow dividend, much of the mispricing goes away. So, and this is our main result. Yeah. So what I show here is the raw monthly return um, uh, by decile portfolio. And this is an arithmetic average across 162 anomalies. Specifically, for each anomaly, we will sort stocks into the style and uh, a compute equally weighted average. Uh, this uh, signals us signs, so you want to buy portfolio 10 and sell portfolio 1, according to the original paper. And if you look at the black line, which denotes unadjusted returns, all of those portfolios produce approximately the same return of about 95 basis points, except for the portfolio 1, which underperforms and only gives you 80 basis points. So in this recent period, the last 15 years, Anomaly performance is underperformance is concentrated entirely in portfolio one. It's not as much as in the original paper, so it's about 15 basis points, 16 basis points per month, so about 2% per year. But we check that it's a, a statistically significant, and I'll take 2%. Now, what happens once we adjust for the borrow fees? As we add back the shadow dividend, of course, the returns for all of the portfolios will go up. For example, the gray line would show you we explicitly add back the fees. All returns go up, but they go up particularly for the portfolio one. That's because portfolio one has many high fee stocks and the fees are really high in there. Alternatively, the dash line, uh, let's don't kind of like uh, worry about the level of the fees. Let's just kick out the high border fee stocks. And again, we get a flat line. What these flat lines mean is once we adjust portfolios for the border fee, there is very little mispricing left give or take a couple of basis points. So that's our main result. Now let's focus a little bit more on the portfolio one and compute abnormal returns for this portfolio and look at the distribution across anomalies. We compute abnormal returns using DGTW uh, benchmarks and we adjust those benchmarks for short selling costs by kicking out high border fee stocks. So basically the returns are unadjusted, but the benchmarks are. So on average, abnormal returns in decile portfolio one, which is this interesting portfolio, uh, is minus 24 basis points per month. And you can see that most of the anomalies, specifically 149 out of 162 anomalies, have negative abnormal returns on average. Now, what would happen if we adjust portfolios for borrow fees? Now, well, the average abnormal return is now zero and the distribution looks much more symmetric. So for every anomaly with positive realized abnormal returns, there is pretty much an anomaly with negative realized returns. This is excluding high fee stocks, 12% of the sample. If we adjust explicitly for the fee, we again get pretty symmetric distribution, maybe like one or two anomalies on the left tail. Well, with 12 minutes, I won't be able to show you like all of the tests, but basically we spend a lot of time just sorting the anomalies and we find there is a very close correspondence between average abnormal return and stock borrow fee, which I call this missing dividend thing. One way to see is just to sort anomalies based on the average borrow fee in portfolio one, the higher the borrow fee, the more negative return. This is the black dots, but once we adjust returns for the borrow fee, it all goes away. We look at uh, different subsamples, which we thought were interesting. We find little variation up there. So the results are very robust. Uh, and finally, of course, everyone has their favorite anomaly. And I encourage you to look in the appendix table where we report each of those anomalies individually. My favorite anomaly is adjacent-cratic risk. So I just integrated this during our sample period on 50 basis points per month, long shot. Uh, all comes from the short lag, so high volatility stocks underperform. Uh, once you try to sort those stocks, which is those two other numbers, you can see that all of those abnormal returns go away and the point estimates actually like slightly change signs. So I just integrated volatility is kind of, is due to borrow fees. So I think I'm out of time, so let me conclude. So what this paper showed is that in the recent period, stock borrow fees seems to be this binding limit of arbitrage, which explains why anomaly uh, alphas don't go all the way back to zero. And more importantly, at least to be, borrow fees seems to be an important component of the returns, but all of us basically not include them in the return. And once you include borrow fees in the return, a lot of name mispricing goes away. And we suggest that researchers exclude high borrow fee stocks and, uh, uh, we plan to provide uh, the data on the high border fee stocks that you can do.
thank you. And I'm looking forward to your questions and comments.